welcome in to the Cover One podcast here, uh, Eric Turner and uh, and John alongside here this evening with us. Uh, we are breaking down the uh, interesting events that happen today at One Bills Drive, of course. And uh, I think I may quote this or tag this day as the uh, the height of the dysfunction at One Bills Drive. Um, and, and it's likely at an all-time high, and it's kind of an unfortunate, I guess, sequence of events, especially for guys like Doug Whaley um, and, and former coach Rex Ryan and new interim coach Anthony Lynn have all been sort of strolled out um, into the media in the, into a co- press conference where they weren't exactly prepared for the questions that were going to be asked, um, and that I think has to cue us to ask questions as to why that was, um, and that's what we're going to do here tonight. Um, so before we get into a few of the specific comments that Doug Whaley had for the, for the media today, uh, one of the things that I really wanted to get into this evening, which we will, um, is just where the state of the organization is, because we didn't get a good, clear um, idea of what that was today, because there was so much emphasis um, on the past week and a half, and we didn't get a clear view of what Doug Whaley's plan was for the future, what he's looking for in a potential new head coach, whether that's going to be Anthony Lynn um, or one of the other names that, uh, that have been kind of funneling through as a lot of the national media uh, will be giving us an idea with reports and, you know, quote unquote sources, uh, which are essentially just the coaches uh, agents at this point. So uh, before we get into all that, let's uh, give uh, that, uh, I guess it was it. We'll, we'll give that video a watch now of Doug Whaley in his, uh, in his press conference today. We just finished our weekly phone conversation with, with Terry, myself and Rex. Uh, Rex asked to speak to him privately. After that I was informed um, that Rex would no longer be our coach. I wasn't privy to the conversation so I cannot get into those details. I look at it this way. I'm the GM of the football operation. I was told by my boss that I will no longer be working with a certain person. My role is not to figure out why. My role is to take the information and go forward and put this up organization in the best possible way to win football games. So for me, I did not add. Terry and I talked. We brought Anthony Lynn in. We discussed it with Anthony Lynn. He wasn't in on every conversation we had about Tyrod that day, but the final one was consulted with Anthony Lynn. So you get a little idea of the geez, atmosphere there at One Bills Drive, and you could kind of see it in his posture, in his body language, that he was frustrated. Um, he did a good job of not wearing that frustration, I thought, on his sleeve. But there were a few opportunities, I thought, that uh, questions certainly were pointed towards Whaley. And as I mentioned, um, the unfortunate part and the unfortunate nature of this interview, um, this press conference today, was we didn't get a clear look into the future. Um, and, and I don't know where you guys stand on this, but uh, I'm leaving with far more questions than I have answers today. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see where you're coming from, you know. It, the things that I would like to have heard, you know, at the season ending press conference weren't really addressed. And part of that is, um, you know, as you'll, you know, expand upon is, you know, he didn't come out last week. I understand that he didn't come out last week when he did fire Rex and whatnot, or they fired Rex. Um, But, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, I, I'm honestly just sick of hearing um, what, you know, we want to do, just do it. You know, if, if the structure's yeah, right. wrong, it was obviously wrong, <clears throat> just fix it and move on. And so I, I understand where he's coming from there. Uh, and it does make us look bad as an organization from top to bottom. But, you know, I do think that the structure that they, uh, he kind of laid out now is the way to go. And it should have been from the get-go. And, and that's, that's what that dysfunction you were talking about. This is the way it should have been from the get-go. Yeah. You know, for my opinion, I, I really like to see more transparency within the organization. And it just seems like they're, they're hiding stuff. And it's who really, at the end of the day, <laughs> the fans, we just want to know the answers. We're the ones out there. We're the ones buying the product. We're the ones that deserve to know what's going on within the organization. And I just feel like there's too many, um, you know, answers that are or questions that are not being answered for whatever reasons. And um, quite frankly, it doesn't make sense to not answer those questions. I mean, they're simple questions. So, <laughs> and at the end of the day, let's be honest about it. Um, you know, Doug Whaley, it seems like he didn't even have a, a, a you know, a, a part of the firing with, with Rex. So why would they even put him out there to answer those questions of the army? Uh, John, that's to me, the biggest point of the day. And what it was to me is it was a lot like the status quo and, and what they've been throwing out. They've, you know, 
after Rex Ryan's firing, instead of having Doug Whaley, instead of having the Pagulas out there for that media firestorm, they put Anthony Lynn, who again had no answers to any of those questions. Yeah, so now right. the media, the sports media is, ha- has a whole week of, you know, opinions, a whole week of columns, a whole week of articles. They have to write with content they don't have. So now they're stuck in the season ending press conference, trying to figure out and, and create four stories and, and really, you could probably say five stories. Yeah. Uh, and now they're stuck creating and, and dwelling on the past week and a half instead of the future, which I think a lot of Bills fans wanted to hear the plan. They wanted to hear, okay, Whaley, this is your opportunity for you to single-handedly choose a coach. How are you going to do it? What are, you, what are you looking for in a potential candidate? Uh, you know, who, what kind of coach are you going to look for? You can look for an offensive-minded coach, a defensive-minded coach. Are you, do you want somebody with experience, or do you want somebody that's going to be fresh-faced? And none of those questions to me were answered. We didn't get a good idea of what they're going to be doing with Tyrod Taylor moving forward. We now know that the decision on Tyrod Taylor will be made when the new head coach is hired, and I think that's the right decision. This next right. head coach, this can't, to me, it, it can't be what happened with a guy like Marone. When Marone came in, Manuel was not his guy. Right. And last year, Obviously, Rex Ryan, his guy was Tyrod Taylor. If the next guy doesn't mm-hmm. want Tyrod Taylor, what you can't do is <laughs> opt into his into his you know season option here and have a new guy come in and say, well, that's not my guy. I, I want to bring in my guy. So in that facet of things, I think was correct. But the idea- I want to go back though, Nate. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, like, go back. I, I feel like um, I, you're giving the media a little too much uh, leeway here because honestly- that's their job. Yeah, they have to create content. So if they have to create that content, that responsibility is on them. The fact that they dwelled on the past is kind yeah. of in their own – that's their own fault. You know, they, they kept wanting to push you know, that he didn't have responsibility in the firing because guess what? That was the narrative from the get-go. They wanted to place all the blame on, on, on Whaley. Oh, that was clear. Pin, yeah, he, they wanted to pin him with that. Well, guess what? If you have content and stuff you have to worry about for the later in the week and you never touch upon those points, as a reporter, that's your fault. Yeah, no, and and believe me, I I can totally understand that point too, but I I guess where I am is because it was handled incorrectly, the problem about, I guess for me, blaming the media for this whole situation or saying like, why are the media asking these questions? Why are they doing this? And again, it's, it's poor planning on the part of the organization. You have to know, and, and this is PR 101. This is when you go to college and you're taking a freshman level PR class. The, the major thing is when you're extinguishing a fire or a controversy, it has to be done within the first 24 hours of that right. controversy or that fire. And what they did was wait a week and a half or whatever it was, 10 days for the anger and all of this stuff for a whole 17 seasons to fester with a media group that's already frustrated with the organization. Right. And that's kind of how it came out today. And I, I just don't want to be the person that is, you know, overly defending the media because I do think there was a lot of issues with what they were asking today. And they didn't exactly, you know, orchestrate this in a way that seemed to me as uber professional. John, but so way, well, I, you- I, I think I, my, my, my thoughts on that, I think there's two, two parts to that is number one, I don't think, the organization knows which way they're going. Number one, let's start there. Mm-hmm. And number two, <clears throat> there really needs to be two press conferences. There needs to be the end of the year evaluation of these press conference, and then there needs to be the explanation behind Rex Ryan's firing. And they try to combo both of those together, and consequently, we only got right the Rex Ryan firing type yeah. of press conference, and really nothing was answered anyway. So. To me, that was a waste of 38 minutes of my life because <clears throat> nothing was really said that I didn't already know. John, so, how do you feel I mean, about, okay, I know you said that, you know, he should have touched upon those points in another press conference, but how much do you think um, that had to do with, you know, thrusting Anthony Lynn from, you know, offensive coordinator to head coach and that short turnaround? And maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't want to, you know, affect um, a normal, you know, work week for them and, and that transition. Maybe they had other things to worry about. I mean, I'm just saying from a, from that standpoint, maybe that had something to do with it too. Cause I mean, that's never really been talked about that could have had, you know, factored into them not throwing well, this big press conference. If you're a, a, you know, respectable organization and you have all those things that we always talk about, integrity, accountability, yada, yada. Um, then Russ Brandon and the Pagulas, whoever was involved with the firing of Rex Ryan, should have held the press conference. 
exclude Doug Wade because obviously he was part of that conversation. <laughs> so, story at all. <laughs> you, you know, so let's let's hear from those those particular individuals first. Get that piece put to sleep so we can move on to the right. season and the evaluation of, this, of the roster and things like that. But to me, it was handled poorly. I don't know. I can't. I know what's his name, Scott, the guy that does the PR for the the Bills. He's been handling his position poorly. Um, he hasn't been able to, like you said, uh, Nate, put out these fires and, and things like that before they turn into you know mass wildfires. So <laughs> there, there needs to be a lot more. Um, structural um accountability within the executives and i'm not seeing it right now no yeah, is, and, is that nate is that surprising that there's not accountability up top and on the field i mean it all starts at the top right and this is kind of where you started this whole conversation so is, was it a big surprise that you know you've heard accountability issues not just in the locker room but on the field and with the coaching staff i know john that's something you always like to talk about and it's true i mean but it does start at the top right nate it does. And, and Whaley brought up, I thought was a good point today is, you know, the reason that he doesn't come out and, and, and speak about Rex Ryan or the reason he doesn't come out and speak about issues in a day to day, because there needs to be one voice. There needs to be one person that is controlling. There needs to be one person. And I like just that. Like, just like Rex's defense, there is far too many talking heads in this defense. Right. Uh, in this but, organization, I mean, and they, if I, I respect that statement, that statement, there needs to be one voice, but you fired that voice last week. So oh, right. now who's, so who's that voice now? You know? So I understand like, go ahead. My, my whole thing was, so the first thing he says, he sits down, he puts his hand out and he says seven to nine, yeah. not acceptable from the owners to the GM, to the head coach, to the players, but it's on me. And then that was the first minute. So it was a 38-minute press conference. The next 37 minutes were example after example after example of why it wasn't his fault and how he wasn't in on the and first right, responsibility. And, yeah. and there was multiple people deciding who was going to be the, who's going to hire Rex Ryan. And I wasn't in the room when they decided to fire Rex Ryan. And right. it was just like, hey, this is on my shoulders. Okay, let me tell you how it's not, though. You I'm know, not privy and, and to that's that, yeah. how it looked, and that's how it came off. And when I look at it now is what reputable head coach in this league or potential head coach in this league wants to work for an organization that has no structure. It's clear now. It is absolutely clear that it is the decisions it is. Uh, it, that your head coach wasn't even really talking to your GM. He was immediately going to the head coach. The, the quote that was in there that to me was the most, I guess, not alarming, but the most insightful was when he said, after their phone call, their weekly Monday morning phone call, Rex said, Terry, I need to speak with you privately. And when they, after their conversation, Doug Whaley was then informed that Rex Ryan was no longer the head coach of the team. Right. And, you know, it, that kind of bugs me, Nate, though, and, and this, it, this kind of ties in is, um, you know, like I said, the structure seems like it's going to be in place now. And, yeah, it's, it looks bad and it's, it looks dysfunctional. And, and it is. I mean, I can't deny that. I can't defend that. It doesn't. Um, but I also think that, you know, the Pagulas have realized that they screwed up. And you know what? The problem, I don't, I mean, I, as a personnel guy, I think Whaley's a great guy. I think a great scout. I think he knows talent. Um, I think yes. that talent has, you know, I mean, hasn't really totally panned out. Obviously, he's got hit and misses, especially, you know, through the draft. But uh, I, I do think that he had the wrong person in his ear from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And that was Russ Brandon. And, and you know what? When, when you hear today that, you know, He's probably going to, you know, start – he's got too many things on the table now that he's not going to be involved. He doesn't know his role. Yeah, and, and, and to just, me, that, that's, that's a good that thing. structure issue. Right, and, and to me, I think that's a good thing, though, because mm -hmm. I think from the get-go, that was the problem. And you kind of touched upon it um, before we went live, you know, about how, you know, when the Pagulas took over, they wanted, you know, a czar, someone to kind of, you know, you know, help with the transition. And, uh, you know, they didn't get that. And you had mentioned what, Bill Pullian, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, you, it, they didn't get that, so – they had to work with what they had and that was right. Russ Brandon. And that, I'm sorry, that guy is not a football guy right. and we all know that. And so the fact that he's not involved anymore, it, it, mm -hmm. supposedly to me, that's a good sign. And yeah, it may be dysfunction, but let's keep it honest here. It's still a head coaching job at, at you know, in the national football league. So I, I, th I do think that, you know, yes. we're still going to be okay. It's, it's just a mess right now. <laughs> yeah. And to be honest, I, I mean, yes. what today, what today showed it wasn't, ineptitude at the general manager level it wasn't failures at the head coaching level it wasn't failures in a player personnel level what it was and what today showed me more than anything was that 
Terry and Kid Bagula are in way over their head. And I, and I really, and, and, and I'm, I mean this is I respect Terry and Kim for keeping the bills in Buffalo and spending their, our, their own money in order to keep a franchise here in Buffalo, other opposed to letting it go to Toronto or whatever was going to happen or whatever the fate of this organization was, if someone else would have bought the team. But at the same time, they waited too long with the Sabres to, to clean house. And now they're five or six years into that organization and it's still a mess. And I at least feel they've put the people in the position to fix that ship with right. the bills. Now, as, as we were talking about the bill Polian decision, when, Polian decided he didn't want to come to Buffalo and he wanted to keep his position at ESPN. Why did you give up? Why did you say you, you identified an issue. You identified that you needed someone to be in here and run the football operation. Someone with experience that can show you what to do as a first time owner in the NFL. Right. Why didn't, when you plan A didn't work, why wasn't there a plan B in place? Why wasn't there a plan C in place? And that to me is just the, the goes into the narrative that these two are, are, are a little bit, out of their comfort zone and and now they need to figure out a way and I don't think that they realized how difficult this would really be I, I, I don't mean I, I don't know about that though because John you kind of touched upon it too um you know we saw the same thing with the Sabres right I mean they've had they had issues at the top from the mm-hmm. get-go with the Sabres and the way they dealt with that uh structure so I mean we yep. should have expected that right John yeah I mean I I was worried about I mean I was fortunate I felt gratified that they bought the team and obviously they're staying in Buffalo. Great. But I, I don't want to root for a team for another 17 years. It's going to be seven and nine, six and 10, <laughs> five, five and whatever. So I need, you know, like I said, I need some true football people in upstairs, you know, people, not a guy that can go sell you the naming rights to the stadium. Thank that's you. Russ yeah. Brandon. I, yeah. Do that. Okay, that's that's what your job is to do. You know, put a new era on the on the on the on the field name, right? But I need someone that knows what they're doing up top, and that has to go from the scouts, player personnel, coaching. I need someone that can evaluate each and every one of those particular positions and uh and um you know positions. So that way, when we're are filling those rosters and those spots, the right people are in place to dictate the rest of the, um, you know, to the, to the players, because if you've got a poor coach in place, um, you can get all the best talent you want. You can get the Sammy Watkins that was pretty much a guarantee lock. Right. But for some reason has not lived up to his billing, whether that's injury or what have you, you need people to be able to develop those guys, but you need people to put those people in place. And we're not, we don't have those people in place. Right. I mean, Doug Whaley to his, to his credit. I mean, I like him as maybe a, a pro personnel guy, maybe not so much. Which is the what general he's been pretty much doing. doing. If you <sighs> like him as a GM, you don't like him as a team president, as a football czar. And yeah. I agree with you, John. Yeah. I think for what mm-hmm. a GM in a traditional, in the most traditional sense of the word, a GM controls the 53, your coach controls the 49 or whatever it is, a 48 man roster, your game day mm-hmm. roster, your GM has yeah. control of the draft, has control of, of, of free agents, and who gets on that 53 man roster. And that is what a GM is supposed to do. And I think, I think you're right, John. I think I like Doug Whaley in that role. Mm-hmm. What I don't like him in the role of is having to play yes. the PR guy for the Pagulas or having to be honest with you to <laughs> choose a head coach. There's a reason why across this, across the national football right. league that the coach and the GM are fired together because typically it's, it's, it's systemic failure from the very top so you get rid of everyone and what you do is you bring in an organization or a third party to conduct that coaching search for you and it's that's why you see a lot of these quote-unquote inside guys these guys that either get kind of you know rerun through a guy who's going to be the head coach for the second or third time or you know a a guy from the same coaching tree as another guy it's because these you know these organizations these third party coaching search companies that there are charlie cashley's uh yeah oh god so I guess I feel a little bit better that this is going to be a cookie cutter search, but at the same time, I don't know that, that there is anybody really qualified to conduct a thorough search for the head coach for the. So you don't, like, you, don't like, you don't trust that Whaley can make the right ch- choice for his head coach for the Bills. I don't think he can make an unbiased choice. I think he's going right. to make the decision based on whether or not he thinks it's going to help him in his job security and moving forward. I don't think that means that it's going to be the best coach for this organization. I think it's going to be the coach that he thinks can get him the best chance right now to win opposed to the best. And this is the thing. It's easy 
And, and I say this because it actually is very hard to be a mediocre football team that averages six to nine wins for 17 years. But what is difficult is rebuilding and, and doing what the Browns are doing and being a terrible football team with the idea that you're going to be good in the future. Or But isn't that true about all GMs, though, Nate? I mean, they want – obviously, they get the chance to pick their guy – and they pick that guy because they're on some philosophical level, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, right. that, I mean, yeah. I, I kind of see that across the league. I don't think Whaley's any different. Um, I think, yeah, of course he's going to pick the guy that helps him, um, you know, benefit in his position because as a GM, that, that's how he's judged. Right, John? You, you gotta, there has to be us. Exactly. You want a guy that's in lockstep with oh, your general manager. There's a, there's a buzz. And that, and, <laughs> lock steps, right. And, 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 <laughs> I, I, th- I think we've used, I think we heard that that term a lot when they hired Rex um, two years ago. Oh, I mean, we're in lockstep. We oh, yeah. we finish each other's senses. <laughs> Let me throw up real quick, Eric. Okay, that that was the worst other thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Okay, number one. But no, there has to be a hierarchy within the organization, right? Within any company, I don't care mm-hmm. if it's a car dealership or a a football organization. There needs to be a hierarchy. And what Doug said in that press conference was that they don't really know how that's going to play out. They have no idea. Number one, Mm -hmm. number one, the owner should always be at the very top, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, your vice president, you know, what have you going on from there? And it's like you're skipping over pieces. So that right there, there's a disconnect and – within the organization because you're passing over some of the guys that right. are helping you build this roster and these teams. So without a hierarchy, you're going to have dysfunction no you matter know, the what. The thing that I really want to look at and, and is the Dallas Cowboys. And, you know, Jerry Jones has taken a lot, a lot of flack over, especially really over the past decade where the Cowboys really haven't done yes. very much winning for mm-hmm. being quote unquote America's team. But mm-hmm. you always know who to blame. You right. all, and, and he right. wears the blame. He And the thing is, yes. is he doesn't care. And I think that the Pagoulas need to be a little bit more like, listen, this is my team. I'm going to build them the way I see fit. And instead, I see, what I see instead is a lot of hiding, a lot of not wanting to face the music. You, Jerry Jones is the first one at the podium and the last one off at every end, end of season interview, at every press conference. They don't go to Jason Garrett. They go, to the, well, they go to Jerry Jones because he's the one that's going to shoulder the blame. And I thought that he's done a terrific job of standing up for Jason Garrett for a lot of years because Jason Garrett's been a football coach of a lot of mediocre football teams. Yeah, yeah. But well, the difference winning, he's also not taking the credit for that winning. He's putting that credit into Jason Garrett's court. And I right, think it's yes. one of those things where if you want to be accountable, you want to be the owners that are, have, are hands in on everything, you also need to be the owners that face the music. And right now, that's not the Pagoulas. And, and the difference between, like, let's say Jerry Jones and <clears throat> the Pagulas is Jerry Jones is actually their general manager, right? If I'm not mistaken. Steven, I think he's so, taken over yeah. as of late, though. Uh, is he? Okay. Yeah. Well, they, I mean, with different. all the respect, okay. You know, they have drafted pretty pretty decent over the last few years, the Dallas Cowboys. Since he so, handed it over and, to Steven, right? I mean, they've they <laughs> right. well, well, the offensive line. It's really yeah. paid off. It has, and I mean, you know, it's. I mean, obviously, they hit the lottery with Prescott. No, too bad. Yeah, (laughs) but no, you 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 don't. Most owners, you don't really hear from. To be honest, at least I don't know. Maybe I'm just not in tune with the rest of the league like that. But um, I think in this particular circumstance, where a, a coach is fired, and it's it was in the media for like two or three weeks before he actually got fired. And it was kind of it was a little awkward the last mm-hmm. few weeks with the Rex press yeah, conference. Rex, they yeah. should have came out and yeah, I mean, let them go. I mean, I, I personally am not a romance, but at least give them the respect of like, hey, you know, I get it. They were waiting till he was mathematically probably eliminated before they made that decision. But I mean, how do you work under those circumstances? I mean, it's impossible. Yeah, and that's that was you know kind of what came out today. You know, that Rex straight up asked him, hey, you know, where do I stand? And he just said, you know, we're he had to tell him, go. you know, it's, it's that time that we're going to, you know, we're going to evaluate the end of the season. But guess what? It's going to happen now. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, and and that's where I agree with, you, you know, I don't think if if it wasn't the Pagoulas, if it wasn't Terry's position, you know, uh, you know, it, it decision to make that firing of Rex, I wouldn't have a problem the way it went down. But it was. And that came out today. 
And you know what? Yeah, I agree. There's, he should at least came out, you know, because it was his decision and they, you know, whether it's the truth or not. And, you know, Doug Whaley put it out there today. It, it sounds like it was. And, and Pagula obviously put out in that the article, uh, you know, a few hours ago. So, I mean, there should have been something. I agree. And um, it does start- like he didn't have to make Eric. He didn't have to. He didn't have to take questions. No, you know, right. the Pagulas. They right. don't have to take questions. They could have had, a, you know, a detailed statement that answered the questions that we wanted to hear and then said, thank you at the end of the thing without any, cause they don't need to answer questions from the media with all due respect. They yeah. need to give a detail, the reason behind that just for peace of mind. So we can put this particular piece to sleep. Mm-hmm. It, and for, and you know, we're already, the season's over. Rex has been fired and we're still talking about it. Yeah. Why? Yeah. That should be put yeah. to sleep already. I'll and look at the product too. on the field from, you know, because this that obviously had something to do with it too. Those guys weren't trying. I mean, you could it affected no. them on that. Horrible. You could go back to that Pittsburgh game. I, I think go go to that Pittsburgh game mm-hmm. and, and you watch that film. And if you come away telling me that you thought that they got the best, that Rex Ryan got the best effort out of his football team that day, I don't know what I don't know what you're watching. I could see that. Uh, yeah. All right. So before we uh, kind of end things tonight, um, you know, I kind of want to just kind of do a real quick round the horn of um, your guys' ideal candidate for this head coaching vacancy moving forward. Um, for me. Um, I, I kind of sit on a fence between wanting the Bills to um, address this situation with a young, um, different-minded coach. Because, unfortunately, where the organization stands now is they don't have a voice. With Rex Ryan, they had someone who could, had the nuance of being able to speak in front of the media and speak. Doug Whaley's not that guy. Anthony Lynn's not that guy. Um, he's not going to go out there and be – uh, the kind of spokesman for your organization. And clearly the Pagulas aren't those people. So they need someone that I don't think necessarily needs to be as brash or needs to be as controversial as Rex Ryan. But I think that needs to be someone who can fluently speak about what is happening with this football team. And if, if it's true and Doug Willie wants to have that quote unquote voice for this team, that it needs to be someone who can handle that voice. And I don't know that Anthony Lynn is quite yet ready to be that voice of any organization, much less the Bills or the Broncos, whoever else he's rumored to go. So for me, uh, the voice I'm really looking for is a guy like Tom Coughlin. Um, I, as much as that's not a sexy pick to me, it may not even be the right pick. But what it is, is it gives you an opportunity to put someone who has experience in this, in this situation. He was in front of the New York media, uh, far more pressure than it is here in Buffalo. I think he's the only real suitable voice for this organization. I would disagree. I don't think Coughlin's a guy. I, I, if you're going long term, and you got to go into this coaching search like that is the case, and, and Whaley alluded to it today. I mean, I, I like Coughlin. Of course, he he's a successful coach in the NFL. Um, but I think he's going to be very similar, you know, similar to you know your Belichick and whatnot. He's not going to give you know, the media, what they want to hear or, or give you your, what direction he's going to head in. He's going to give you the cookie cutter answers in my opinion. And I, that's honestly, that's the way I want my coach to be. I think Rex Ryan gave too much to the media, right? Not just in his, you know, with his bravado, but with, you know, his, his game plan type stuff. You know, I think he was too open with the media and honestly the media was, you know, you know, kind of spoiled when it came to that. I, what it comes down to is give me an offensive minded coach right now. I need an offensive minded teacher. All right, and Nate and John, I know you yes. agree with me there. You need a teacher. Mm-hmm. And, and today's uh, NFL, you got to have someone that teaches and relates well um, in the classroom and on the field. So uh, I could care less about how he is in front of the camera. And honestly, I don't want him giving any information out. Right. Uh, give me those cookie cutter answers. But guess what? Just win. So, I mean, as far as who, who they're bringing in right now, I mean, I think Kim said today there's what? five or six candidates they're going to interview instead of the 10 to 12 they did before. Yeah. And I, well, who are those? Uh, Lynn, uh, Frank Reich, um, Howard. Um, right. And Vance yeah, Joseph. Vance and, Joseph, the OC from yeah. the Cardinals. Uh, right. I don't know his first name, but Howard. Aaron Goodwin. Goodwin. That's the defensive coordinator for the Dolphins. Uh, <laughs> Vance Joseph. Yep. So, I mean, those, there's a few there and I know that if it's really five to six, those, I mean, I don't see Coughlin in that yet, but no. I, I mean, I honestly think like uh, we, we know this is Buffalo guys. We're not, I don't think we're going to get that big name coach. We're not going to get that hot candidate. I don't think. Um, so, I mean, from that list, I, I mean, I, I think Lynn has a really good shot, whether they're yeah. setting him up to eventually get that with the guys they are bringing in as, you know, for interviews. I mean, that could be debated it, honestly, because, out of the, that group, Lynn, to, to us, especially, you know, on the offensive side, he would bring back continuity and whatnot. So, I mean, I like him. 
um, and what he stands for in, in the locker room. He's respected uh, across the NFL. He's paid his dues. And yeah, he, he made, uh, you know, quite the rise from, you know, position coach to uh, interim head coach and whatnot. But I mean, from what I've seen on offense and, and I know you guys both agree, you know, he did pay his dues and was mm-hmm. quite creative in, with someone else's system. So as mm-hmm. of right now, I mean, based on what we have, and honestly, it really, it's going to hinge on everything with this roster too, because we have so many free agents. So I, I would have to say Lynn is that guy. And he, I do believe he has an inside track. And I, I think you said it too, Nate, that you believe that eventually he, he's probably going to be the head coach though, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's well, my thought on it, but I mean, John, I don't know what you would, what your opinion is on it. I mean, like I said, I'm well, on the fence about it. I just don't right. know what I want or what this organization wants is that next coach. And like I said, I mean, I, that's why I'm on the fence about it. Well, you figure if if you bring back Lane, you're bringing back Tyrod, right? I mean, you would I think assume. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, and then <clears throat> I heard a report that Lynn may snag up Gus Bradley as his defensive I, I like coordinator, which I, I, I like that. <clears throat> but you know, I'm not sure if if you know is that is that a seven and nine type of uh, formula? I, I don't know. Um, you know, we certainly will we'll find out. But you know. I, there's a guy out there that I've been kind of clamoring for years and all he does is win and he's just, he coaches his players well. And it's kind of a, a, a name that you may not be familiar with fellas, but uh, Chris Peterson uh, from Washington, right? Um, so you're going all college. He did, I'm going to college, man. And, and, and what he's done is he's taken a team like Boise state pretty much undefeated every year while he was with them mm-hmm. took Washington I mean, they were – who was Washington for the last 10, right. 15, 20 years? And also, they're the top four. Um, and, and his offenses are always – they're always um, very uh, innovative. Mm-hmm. Um, they're sound. And, and, and there's a lot to uh, like about his teams. And, you know, he, he puts talent in the NFL. Um, you know, JJI, one of the guys. I mean, you can put on a list just from, just from a school like Boise. So right. he can – obviously – has an eye for talent. So for me, if I'm going outside of the NFL and getting rid of all these retreads and right. these, these uh, you know, coaches that have sons that, you know, the Shanahan's and the, the, the morning wags and all those fellas, I mean, give me someone new fresh to the NFL. I mean, it might be a little bit daunting for him at first, but I think that's a guy that can turn an organization. He's done it twice at the college level, albeit, but um, I think that's someone that, I would certainly like to talk to if I'm the Pagulas and see um, if he has interest, A, and if it's something that is, um, you know, it wouldn't be too much for him to to take on. So for college level, obviously that's someone I would I would like to see. Um, in the NFL, I do, if I have to settle, then I feel like that's what I'm doing by taking Lynn um, and bringing on Bradley. I feel like I'm settling for that, and, and we might be seeing some more of the same uh, over the last few years. So, you know, I, I would like to see a whole new fresh start with new faces. If we're going to, if we're going to blow it up, blow the whole damn thing up. You know, I, I respect Anthony Lynn and what he's done. I mean, sure. We have the number one ranked rushing defense, the number 32 ranked passing, or I'm sorry, rushing offense, number 32 pass, pass uh, offense. What does that give you? You know, a seven to 19. Um, so I just need to see more. We need a number one is what we need is a, a quality quarterback coach, someone that can teach the quarterback don't, please position. Don't get going on this shot. We're going to have to save that one. For I'm sorry. No, I had to go there. I had to do it. I couldn't let. I couldn't let that off the off the hook. But no, that's it's 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 serious. But no, go ahead. That's my take on the coaching. All right. All right. Cool. Thanks, Sean. Um, real no quick. Problem. Um, so as. Uh, as Eric kind of alluded to, I will be joining the cover one team um, essentially full time now, uh, moving forward into the off season. I'm going to be kind of spearheading the draft um, side of things, really get, th- get going. I-, I know I've got some things kind of on, on, on the docket moving forward, some big board rankings, um, some far, far too early big board rankings, um, you know, some positions of need breakdown, uh, you know, a top five of all the positions that the Bills are going to really be looking at this off season. Obviously, uh, some mock drafts as well. But uh, an interesting uh, portion that I don't, I don't think really gets enough attention is the Senior Bowl. Uh, and I'm going to be diving into the Senior Bowl. We actually have a scout for the CFL uh, who's going to be embedded at the CFL for us, um, which will be a great asset, I think, for the Cover 1 team yeah, to have awesome. a scout there 
um, kind of giving us first look information. So uh, yeah, all that stuff and uh, appreciate obviously Eric uh, bringing me along and I'm excited. Hey, for- we're, we're welcome. You know, we want to have you, man. And uh, you know, you and John are going to be working a lot together when it comes to draft stuff. Cause that's Johnny loves that stuff. So, um, and of course I'm going to be pitching in there too. I'm going to mm-hmm. start probably with, you know, most of the evaluations of, you know, our free agents, you know, whether to bring them back and how they did this year and how they fit. Of course, I can't do that until we find out who that coach is. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I'll still be pitching in with the draft stuff, but Nate, Nate's going to be ahead on that. So um, we're, we're happy to have you, man. And honestly, Real qu- we're ready for take, to take this to the next level. Yes. Real quick, guys, what do you think about us finishing in the top 10 with our draft positioning? I mean, I looked at that this morning and it was floored by that. I, I didn't realize we were that bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm honest say, with you, well, but. Let me just say is, is being a Bills fan for as long as I have been, for them to finally, finally lose that game that they always win. They yeah, always right. win that last regular meaningless yeah. regular game to, to catapult them from the seventh pick to the 13th. They always win that game. So right. to be honest, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about the fact that they didn't win a stupid meaningless football game and they've ensured yes. the possible pick that they could over the last three weeks. And kind of put a bow on that. You know who I, I give credit to? Doug Whaley. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say he that. No, EJ Manuel. Um, yep. In his, when he didn't he have to, you know, he, he tanked it. I mean, yeah, absolutely. You know, you may call him a turd, but he's a polished turd because he knew what he was doing. I'm yeah. sorry, guys. He made, he made, he made a good play there, man. Because that that could be the difference. You know, we might be able to get a get a quarterback or a huge player. I don't know, whoever it is. That's a yep. great play. Hey, absolutely. So. So we'll wrap it up here. Cover one, the podcast, go ahead and check out cover one.net. Thanks for joining Nate, John, and, and I, you know, for this uh, 10th episode of the podcast and be sure to check out the site here in the next couple of days. Uh, we're going to start, you know, revving this up, the off season talk and whatnot. Thanks for joining us.